Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to, to some of you who are in different, different parts of the world. I would like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, without making it too, too, too long, let's, let me introduce the director of BDT, uh, Doreen Bogdan, so she can uh, give us the opening remarks, and then probably after that, Nick will take over and we'll have a discussion on NCS. Thank you. Doreen, the floor is yours. I think you are muted, yeah. Can someone unmute Doreen, please? Okay, thank you for that. I was also muted, Orhan. Uh, so good morning and uh, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I heard uh, we have some early risers with us today. We heard some uh, colleagues waking up at three in the morning. So uh, a special good morning to you. Uh, I'm very pleased to be joining all of you today to discuss this very important subject of cybersecurity, uh, which is an integral part of our digital strategies. We have all had cyber incidents, whether as institutions, organizations, or even as individuals. Uh, cyber crimes and cyber attacks have become commonplace, uh, plaguing online users. And this, of course, requires a collective responsibility for all of us to see how we can really make cyberspace more secure and also increase the confidence of the users to this critical resource. As we have our eyes on, uh, on bringing the unconnected 3.6 billion people online, we must also give equal attention to areas that may hinder the meaningful and effective use of the web. Digital uh, is the future of development. It cuts across every sector of the economy and we must make sure that it is secure. Many countries that have embraced the digital transformation journey are launching strategies and initiatives to improve connectivity and to find ways to leverage the benefits of ICTs and to increase efficiency. I think we all know that, that COVID-19 has really put the spotlight on connectivity as well as the need for resilient digital infrastructure. It has also been an accelerant for digital transformation. And today we really find ourselves at a critical point, trying to leverage the transformational power of ICTs for economic growth and social development, while at the same time, rapidly evolving cyber risks are threatening the confidentiality, the integrity, and the availability of ICT infrastructure and services. People's trust and confidence in the use of ICTs are eroding due to cyber insecurity. And of course, these concerns have really been highlighted throughout this, this COVID pandemic. Cybercrime damages are projected to, to exceed a staggering $6 trillion in 2021. Financial institutions, tech companies, hospitals, government agencies, and just about every other sector are investing in cybersecurity infrastructure to protect their business practices and the millions of customers that trust them with their data. And from our perspective, this is why comprehensive national cybersecurity strategies are so important. Uh, and this is a point that was also well noted in the UN Secretary General's Digital Cooperation Roadmap that was launched just a few months ago, where he highlighted the importance of public, of, of trust, security, and, and stability. To, to reap the benefits and, and manage the challenges of, of digitization, countries need to be, countries need to be focused on the importance of ICT-enabled infrastructure with comprehensive national cybersecurity strategies. Uh, these strategies seek to respond to cyber risks by coordinating actions for prevention, preparation, response, and incident recovery between government authorities and other stakeholders. And at the ITU, as many of you know, we engage in ongoing cybersecurity projects, activities, and regular interactions in many countries to raise awareness and to help build the needed skills. These activities aim to really instigate strategic reflection into national cybersecurity activities and outcomes, including support to national policymakers, 
to help them develop, establish, and also to implement national cybersecurity strategies and capacities. The COVID crisis has also prompted us to further broaden this initial vision and, and the reach of our national cybersecurity support to also include digital training, as well as formative activities on cybersecurity governance at the national level. And I wanted to highlight very quickly a couple of examples. To improve readiness and incident response capabilities of developing countries, we conduct annual cyber drill exercises and technical trainings. Some of you may have been joining into our global uh, cyber drill that's been, that's been running over the past several weeks. Uh, we also try to help countries develop similar capabilities at the national level when, when possible. And I also wanted to, to take this opportunity to, to highlight some of the work that we're doing in the space of child online protection and trying to work to mitigate online harms, especially for the most vulnerable amongst us, that is our children and our youth. We launched around the time that the UNSG launched the, the digital cooperation roadmap, we launched our latest child on, online protection guidelines. Um, and we will be having a session later today to share those guidelines uh, uh, in a regional context in the Americas region. And then of course our work in the space of national cybersecurity strategies, which is what we're gonna talk about today in September, we uh, working together with 20 international partners from the private and public sectors, from academia, from civil society, we started the process to update our second edition of the guide to developing a national cybersecurity strategy. This guide is really intended to trigger strategic discussions uh, and also to help national leaders and policymakers to develop and implement their national cybersecurity strategies. It's comprised of a set of principles based on a range of experiences, knowledge, and expertise of stakeholders. The second edition update, I think, could not be more timely to address the new challenges, many challenges that we have seen throughout this, this COVID pandemic. Uh, and when we look back to the first edition of, of the guide in 2018, uh, I would say we're very encouraged to see the number of cybersecurity strategies worldwide have significantly increased. When we first did our global cybersecurity index back in, in, in 2018, our data showed us that only 76 countries had adopted a national cybersecurity strategy. Our more recent data shows us that 120 countries have these strategies in place or under development. Uh, which I think is very encouraging. And of course, at the ITU, with our, our hybrid membership base, which comprises 193 member states, our 900 members from industry, regional uh, pan-governmental bodies, academia, civil society, and research institutes, I think we bring, we bring a unique uh, platform uh, to the fore for collaboration. Uh, we consider multi-stakeholder partnerships as part of our DNA. Uh, it is the basis virtually of all of our work, both at headquarters as well as in the field. And I simply want to invite all of you to continue to collaborate with us to ensure that the online world is safe for current and future users. And to, and to do that, we really need to advance real and implementable solutions in a partnership way. And as the UN Secretary General stated when he launched the roadmap back in June, it is important for all of us to redouble our efforts to better harness the potential of digital technologies while mitigating the harm that they may cause. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I just wanna thank you for the opportunity to address you today. Uh, and I, I wish you a successful webinar. Thank you very much, Orhan, back to you. Thank you, Doreen. Thank you for these uh, incredible remarks. And, and now I would like to pass the floor to, to Nick. But before Nick takes over, I think uh, Andrea Rigon is not connected yet. Maybe let's see if he connects in the meantime. Thank you. Back. All right. Thank you. And thank you, Orhan. And thank you, Doreen, uh, for uh, those opening remarks as well. 
Uh, I am Nick Espinoza. Uh, I am the chief security fanatic of Security Fanatics here in Chicago uh, in the United States. I'm also the official spokesperson for the COVID-19 Cyber Threat Coalition uh, and the creators of the five laws of cybersecurity. Um, so I'm very happy to be here uh, with ITU moderating this uh, wonderful discussion uh, with some of the top cybersecurity experts around the globe. Uh, I think everybody here is going to agree that, that adopting and developing a national cybersecurity strategy for any country is of paramount importance here. Uh, that is obviously just just beyond critical in this day and age with the proliferation of criminal hacking and, and everything else. So with that, I'm going to go over a few uh, housekeeping items before we start actually with the panel and have them introduce themselves uh, for us. And as Orhan mentioned, we are waiting for Andrea and hopefully uh, he will be here. So uh, somebody just please send me a message in chat uh, when Andrea shows up because I see a lot of people on my screen right now and I want to make sure I don't miss him. So with that, uh, please make sure that your microphones are muted. Uh, the ITU has somebody uh, that will go through and, and check that out for you, but make sure that you are, you are keeping those muted because obviously we want to give the full attention to whoever is uh, speaking on the panel you know, at the time. Uh, you know, photos or screenshots um, are going to be taken throughout the session, and uh, we request that the speakers and the moderator, myself, uh, basically keep our cameras on and all of that during the session so uh, the ITU is able to get some really good screenshots as well. Uh, also, please use chat only for raising questions related to the topic, um, you know, that, uh, that we are talking about. This will actually obviously help us moderate what is essentially going to be a large meeting with a lot of people. The one thing that we are not going to be straying into to uh, is politics of any country uh, or organization, primarily because I think everybody here can agree that uh, cybersecurity is essentially agnostic uh, to the political system. We all need it. And so let's make sure that we are, uh, we are making sure of that. We're also going to be using a platform called Mural, which is actually very interesting. It's an online visual uh, collaborative workspace. Uh, if you guys want to uh, show that on the screen right now, ITU. Um, and basically, we're going to be gathering uh, main recommendations that are spurring uh, from this discussion and a link to the mural page uh, will shortly be posted in the chat. Um, and then you can obviously use the chat platform to make any, uh, there it is, uh, to make any uh, comments or questions and all of that. ITU moderators will be monitoring uh, audience input throughout the discussions, as myself as well will be looking for questions that I can be inserting, uh, you know, absolutely into everything uh, as the speakers are talking uh, and all of that. So I think we're going to have a uh, a pretty good time. Um, there is going to be a recording of Mural and, and everything else. It's going to be compiled actually into a recommendation paper um, on empowering women uh, in cybersecurity, which is uh, absolutely a wonderful thing. And finally, uh, the chat and video recording, and this is being recorded. You should be able to see that in the top left of uh, your Zoom window there, uh, may be used for ITU reports, materials, and other things. So just heads up on that. Uh, so uh, that's, that's where we're at. And that's where we're at now. Uh, that said, let's start introducing our panel. Um, and uh, apparently Andrea is uh, is on now. So thank you for that, Chris. And uh, Andrea, why don't you, uh, and, and, and for the record, if I pronounce anybody's name wrong, please correct me. I apologize in advance uh, and uh, we'll go from there. But Andrea, why don't you introduce yourself first uh, so we know you're here and uh, just basically uh, give your basic bio and thank you. Oh, thank you very much. And I'm very sorry I joined late, but this is, you know, welcome to the crazy world of Zoom calls, you know, all day. It's like, you know, an airplane, if it takes off, you know, the first flight late and then... Uh, so 32 years in cybersecurity, I've just learned one thing in my life uh, um, uh, that's, you know, cybersecurity got passionate about big problems, big challenges, and it looks like, you know, governments uh, are in the best position. Uh, worked many years, uh, both for the advisory side, spent a few years in Buzal and Hamilton, but then I also work for governments. Uh, I served my prime minister uh, as head of cyber cybersecurity, um, supporting many initiatives uh, in particular with United Nations uh, and uh, uh, ITU on this topic where I'm very passionate. So here I am to contribute to this great discussion. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, and thank you. It's uh, I, this is just going to be so fascinating. Uh, and just by order of people I see on my screen, uh, Sam, would you uh, would you care to go next for me? Yes, thank you, Nick. Good morning. I hope everyone can hear me. I'm Sam Visner. Uh, I'm honored, by the way, to be here today, and I thank the International Telecommunications Union uh, for inviting me. Thank you very much. Uh, I am, as I said, Sam Visner. I'm the director 
of the National Cybersecurity Federally Funded Research and Development Center in the United States. Um, my company, MITRE, which is a nonprofit corporation, manages the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence for the National Institute of Standards and Technology. I'm also a professor of cybersecurity policy operations and technology at Georgetown University. I've served in the US government in the Department of Defense, and I've also managed a couple of cybersecurity businesses. So I've been in government, I've been in the private sector, and now in the nonprofit sector, working cybersecurity for several decades. So again, thank you, uh, Nick, and thank you, ITU, for inviting me. And thank you, thank you. And uh, uh, as you mentioned when we first met, uh, organizing this, it's it's great to have the band back together. It's good to see you again. Thank you very much. And somebody that I just met recently, uh, and also next on my screen would be Chris. Chris, can you please introduce yourself as well? So thank you. Um, again, Chris Gibson. I am the executive director of First, which is the Forum of Incident Response and Security Teams. Um, been in this game probably 20 plus years, a bit like Sam. Um, very similar to Sam, I started in the private sector. I spent three years, uh, I built and ran CERT UK, the UK's first formally chartered national incident response team. So, so very focused on result, you know, building that to fix and, and to comply with the national cybersecurity strategy that the UK had at the time. I have then moved on a little bit and spent some time working as a CISO and now I'm in the nonprofit sector in first, so I'm all about building collaboration, coordination across the world amongst incident response teams. Pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. And thanks for being here as well. And uh, I, I appreciate it. So the next one up, um, Agvile, and I believe I am pronouncing that correctly. If not, please correct me. Are you here? Yes, I'm here. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. You pronounce it very well. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Um, uh, so my name is Akvile Ginotiana. I'm uh, head of uh, Cyber and New Technology Unit at the United Nations Office of Counterterrorism, United Nations Counterterrorist Center. I recently joined it this year. Prior, prior to that, I worked for five years in the private sector as an international consultant helping uh, countries around the world to develop national cybersecurity strategies. I worked in Southeast Asia, in Europe, in um, South America, in Africa. And before that, I worked for the government almost 20 years in different capacities, mostly in national security sector. I, have, I had a successful career in the military. So that, that's my background. And thank you for inviting me to participate in this um, very interesting and relevant discussion. And thank you for being here. And I think it will be both interesting and relevant, as you say, just given the landscape today. Uh, with that, uh, Irfan, are you here as well? To myself, so I'm Irfan Hemani. I currently work um, for the UK government in our Ministry uh, of Digital Culture, Media and Support, uh, where I am head of um, the team that looks at uh, uh, the drafting of the new cybersecurity strategy along with our international work and skills policy. Um, I started my career in the private sector actually uh, at Deloitte, like one of my um, uh, co-panelists, um, where I uh, worked on information security and technology uh, largely after the Sarbanes-Oxley Sarbanes Act in the early 2000s, kind of security and technology um, auditing and monitoring um, to, 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 to the front. So uh, I started my career uh, in, in, in the area around 15, 16 years ago um, and have done various things since then. Um, yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Irfan. And um, also uh, next up would be Pratima. Uh, Pratima, are you here? Uh, hello. Can you Hello. hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi. Hello. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Nick. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I am Pratima Pradhan, and I work as a senior ICT officer at uh, Bhutan Cert. It's computer incident response team, not emergency response team. Um, I've been working with the government of Bhutan for past eight years, and I have joined BT Cert only in the beginning of this year. Uh, that's because I completed master's degree in cybersecurity. Uh, last year in uh, 2019. 
Uh, before joining BitDesert, I was working with the division that takes care of application development and uh, management. At present, I look after the development and implementation of national cybersecurity strategy. Um, I would like to thank ITU for giving BTSERT this opportunity to share our experiences. And I would also like to thank on my behalf uh, for the privilege given to me among the experts. Thank you. And thank you, and thank you. And just as a quick reminder to, uh, to our panelists, um, because we have interpretation going on, I should have mentioned this in the housekeeping, uh, let's make sure that we are not uh, speaking as fast. That will be my problem as I am usually a quick talker, uh, you know, and I have a radio show and there's no dead air. So, so by virtue of that, uh, thank you all. Um, we will eventually be joined by uh, Martin Koyabi as well of the Commonwealth Telecommunication Organization. And at that point, Martin, I would love for you to introduce yourself, but I'd love to dive in uh, to the, uh, basically to the questions right now. And I'm actually gonna start where I started the introductions with Andrea. And I, I think this is actually a really good place to start because there has been a proliferation of national cybersecurity strategies worldwide. And according to the ITU repository, more than 110 companies, uh, countries, excuse me, have adopted a national cybersecurity uh, strategy. Doreen also mentioned that as well. Now, given the overall rise of cybersecurity development as a public policy phenomenon, what countries, or, or rather, why should countries, or why do countries uh, start creating national uh, cybersecurity strategies? So uh, um, it looks like if you don't have a cybersecurity strategy, you are not dealing seriously uh, um, uh, with the phenomenon or with the topic. Uh, uh, and from a certain perspective, this is true. I mean, uh, um, and we need to clarify uh, uh, what a strategy is. Uh, um, strategy is not uh, a document uh, where you just describe your high level objectives. Uh. Strategy is your real strategy. What you intend to do as a country, as a government uh, to protect your national uh, interest uh, being economic, uh, the economic development of the country, protecting the business, protecting the citizens, the freedom uh, um, of the citizens. A strategy uh, um, can also be not public. Some countries decided to have a strategy and simply they uh, uh, decided not to have a, a, a visible strategy, something that can be read and commented by other countries. But even those countries, they have a very specific strategy. So that's the first reason why this is gaining popularity. Uh, um, there are also some initiatives globally that are asking governments to become vocal about their strategies, uh, uh, in particular, looking at indexes to uh, um, uh, understand what a country is doing on, 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 on cybersecurity. One of the first questions uh, uh, that governments are asked to respond is, do you have a strategy? Now, I would this make a distinction between the strategy with a small S and the strategy with a capital S, uh, that means not just a document uh, where you, know, you talk about the importance of protecting critical infrastructure, where you state that international cooperation is important, blah, blah, blah. Of course, you know, uh, uh, um, this is a good first step. From the strategy with a capital S, uh, that is how a government uh, is going to play its fundamental role in orchestrating the protection of the national interest in cyberspace. Yeah, and I, I think that's a really good point too, uh, in the sense of, of quantifying exactly what a strategy should be, uh, you know, for for a country. It's a huge, huge problem, and uh, I think we've all seen organizations, even at the national level, that basically might have something written down, but not necessarily executed upon. And while it's great on paper, it really doesn't help us when when we're under under threat. And so, by virtue of that, I think when we're talking about strategies, and Chris, I'm going to pivot to you real quick. What are the most important goals to be basically included at the strategic and policy level to ensure a country's readiness, resilience, and capability uh, to recover, as well as obviously quickly restore services uh, after they have some kind of incident? And just given your relationship and your work with FIRST, I think that's a, that's a really good question to ask you. Sure. Um, so I guess the first thing to think about when you're when you're creating a strategy, and I was peripherally on, I was involved on the sidelines in the creation of the, the present UK strategy, is is really making sure you join all the dots right across 
both government but private sector academia and so on this is not something government can solve on its own it's not something the private sector can solve on its own but you need that strategy needs to encompass both of those to work out how to improve the life you know how to improve your 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 resilience going forward and how to make your country a more resilient space for for cyber security for cyber and so on um, measuring it is difficult. Um, we've all had this challenge for years and, and, and in all aspects of cybersecurity. Um, it's always been a challenge to prove whether you're doing a good job. If you see more incidents, is that because you're better at detecting them or because you're more vulnerable? If you, if you fix more incidents more quickly, is that because you're not seeing the difficult incidents, you're only looking at the easy ones? So it's always been a challenge. There, there was one of the one of the measures that that I've heard used when I was in the civil service in the UK was it was sort of a it's sort of it's almost an intangible is is there someone with a grip on this is there some one person or one area that actually sees the whole picture and can and get that together and understand that and report that up the line so when you have a major incident are oh, 10 different bits of government running around in 10 different directions to do stuff because if they are that's really bad you know what you need is is that coherent solid strategy that everybody understands how they play in this how they work on this how they interact together but i think to be fair more importantly how do you get that single view of the of what's going on you know single single point of truth single statement of truth going up the ladder into into senior management you could call it you know senior politicians whatever so that they can understand this there's also how do you measure you know how do you how do you how do you push that into public sector and private sector? So, you know, if you go to someone and, and this was a comment that was made by the head of the Bank of England at the time, he said he didn't know who to go to when there was a cyber incident. Does he go to law enforcement? Does he go to the intelligence services in the UK? Does he go to CERT? Does he go to his private one? There are too many moving parts. It's, and it is. I mean, that is a challenge in our world. But a good cyber strategy will bring those all together into a quite a simple, coherent state that everybody can understand and work with. Yeah, and I, I think that's a really good point. Uh, and, and I think what it essentially brings up, the point that you're making right here, I think really leads into the gap analysis you know, that we all essentially have to do at a, at a national level uh, you know, to make sure that we do know uh, who we should be calling, that we do have those contingency plans in place uh, and everything else. Um, just also FYI on a complete aside, uh, just an audience member had requested in terms of uh, interpretation and translation that we should all slow Ooh. down. Myself, I am the most guilty of that. <laughs> there is, there is no doubt of that, um, but just, just as a quick reminder, but to stay, to stay on gaps, uh, Sam, just real quick, what gaps exist in international cyber governance and how implementing monitoring and evaluation mechanisms at the strategic level can help governments uh, basically uh, filling these gaps and, and, and understanding their own, their own gap analysis. Nick, thank you for that question. And as you know, I live in Washington, DC. So having thanked you for that question, I'm first going to answer a different question. And then I'll come back to that question. Please. I want people to distinguish carefully between policy and strategy. A policy is what a country intends to do what interests it intends to pursue. A strategy is how that is done. And one thing I urge every country to have is a policy and strategy architecture. The group of stakeholders from government, from industry, from academia, from nonprofits, from every sector who help define and understand what the country's policy will be with some guidance from the country's leadership. That has to be translated to a strategy architecture, which is how one achieves the policy. And that strategy architecture has two great values. The first is that it provides a mechanism for broad representation from all the sectors that are involved. And secondly, it also couples the strategy to the resources, capabilities, and responsibilities of each sector and each stakeholder because cybersecurity is a whole of nation problem. It includes government, it includes critical infrastructure, it includes manufacturing, it includes the private sector, it includes the economy, it includes civil society. So it is important to have an architecture that provides a means for not only their representation, 
but for each of them understanding and implementing their, their role. In terms of international governance, there are several problems. One problem I think is the overall uh, lack of a common framework for planning. And I think a common framework for planning is something which if all countries shared would make it easier, A, for countries to understand what each other is doing and B, for countries to work together. So such a framework like cybercrime prevention and prosecution, incident response, resilient operations, risk management and resourcing, policy and standards, civil law, regulation, accountability, public awareness and a culture of cybersecurity and a cybersecurity workforce, if that or another framework, though that I think is a very good framework, were shared by countries, it would provide better international governance and better international cooperation. My last point is this, we need better international transparency. We need international mechanisms to identify um, if countries or criminal groups are developing offensive capabilities and testing them and using them such that countries can be held more to account. I look for an example at the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization which built an international monitoring capability um, that allows for the detection of nuclear weapons testing and development. And it not only does a good job technically in my opinion, but it also does a good job from an international governance perspective. So over time, moving to some shared understanding of how to detect um, illicit cyber activities and to hold particularly uh, cyber criminals to account I think is something that ought to be done. And I do think there have been useful steps in this direction. I would urge that more attention be given to them. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, thank you. And I, I think what you're saying really underscores the need to have that collaborative, uh, you know, international uh, basically coalition that is essentially gonna come together and, and really, uh, really tackle this problem, which I think is just a huge, huge issue that the entire globe has. And with that, I'm gonna to pivot to Agvile real quick uh, because the global outreach of, or the, rather the global reach of cyber criminals, um, you know, there's no real single national law enforcement apparatus that can legally pursue malicious actors. Even though we have things uh, like Interpol and some others, what are the existing international regional channels to bring together law enforcement, private industry and academia to build and share those resources, things like strategic information and threat intelligence to uh, essentially identify uh, and counter cyber criminals. Uh, what are the typical minimum requirements, do you think, uh, for basically a country to essentially engage and build partnerships in this manner? Thank you, Nick, uh, for this question. Uh, well, uh, regarding international collaboration, so everything starts at the national level. So countries' engagement in international co collaboration is defined by its policy, strategic approach. So uh, internationally, um, as you mentioned, Interpol and Europol are, are those channels that information regarding cybercrime activities can be exchanged. Uh, co joint investigations could be conducted. So in terms, uh, there are different initiatives to bring um, uh, private sector together. There is a global forum, counter-terrorist forum where industry uh, comes together to look at the, the terrorist activities online and look for the solutions how to counter that. There are uh, uh, efforts to help uh, mem member states uh, to exchange information in prosecuting um, criminal offenses and counterterrorism offenses. So one of those uh, initiatives was a joint counterterrorism executive directorate and UNODC publication on practical guide for requests of electronic evidence from internet service providers and uh, in different jurisdictions, because we see this is a problem when you need information from, from Facebook, from Amazon to prosecute uh, crimes and cyber crimes. So this guide helps the member states to approach that in a more effective manner, know how to request um, information, request the evidence that is outside the jurisdiction. So these are the efforts internationally. And of course, there are various initiatives and uh, 
uh, in terms of collaborations of incident response team uh, at first and uh, bilateral uh, cooperation that is happening, but uh, more effort is needed in that regard and uh, ways to explore how to, to make this cooperation more effective is also needed. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, thank you. And I, I think that's a, a really good point, especially when we're talking about the massive online platforms that the, the world simply seems to use like Facebook. Uh, you know, outside of cyber crime, we've seen, we've simply seen issues with this on the privacy side. Uh, Europe, for example, has the GDPR, the United States doesn't have anything like that, uh, you know, which makes obviously a disparity in law, which I think obviously translates, uh, as you say, into, you know, into the cyber crime side of things. But I think this is actually a really good place to uh, pivot to Martin Koyabi uh, with the Commonwealth Telecommunication Organization, because obviously the Commonwealth Wealth is uh, a rather large organization across the globe. And uh, Martin, if you could uh, please introduce yourself, uh, I'd appreciate it. And then uh, I've got a question for you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Nick, and also for the panelists uh, who have just come before me. Uh, my name is Martin Koyabe. I work for the Commonwealth Telecommunication Organization. My main role is to look at the tech technical support and consultancy across the 54 or 53 countries, depending on who is in or who is out. And uh, we do look at issues ICT related. And so far in relation to this particular webinar, uh, we've been looking at uh, cybersecurity, cybercrime, and cyber standards across some of these uh, 54 nations. Back to you, Nick. Uh Thank you, thank you, and welcome, welcome. Because uh, obviously the, the, common, the Commonwealth countries, as you say, there's, there's quite a few of them, but like other countries, they have a need for implementing a national cybersecurity strategy. However, being a Commonwealth company can also, country, excuse me, can also pose some unique challenges. Can you tell us about your experience with national cybersecurity strategies uh, in this vein? Yeah. Uh Thanks for that again. And I know there are people on this panel who might have had experience with some of the countries that I mentioned. Hi. But coming back to the point, I think I agree with Andrea and Sam. And Can I do it in about? Sorry. I, I agree with the other panelists when they talked about what a strategy is. And I think Sam put it very clearly. It's what you, the actions that you take. I look at it as a map that says, OK, you're going from point A to B. What do you want to achieve along the way? And are you going to stop? Are you going to have some fuel? You, so you plan what you're going to do along the way. And in simple terms, there are very many uh, challenges that many of these countries do face. But I'll just go through them in, uh, you know, in the short time that I have. One is the issue around, as pointed out earlier, the support within the national support for having a strategy. Uh, this is very, very important because the multi-stakeholder partnership that has been evangelized all along is a very important component to make sure that you have support from different sectors as put up by uh, one of the panelists. So therefore, the support by the government to make sure that you have a cybersecurity strategy is a very important aspect of it. And when you have a strategy, as Andrea said, it's, it's, uh, the strategy is the action, it's the people, it's what you do. But the point is that we reach a point where you have a document, which is a strategic document, but you don't know what to do in the next step. So one challenge has always been, what is the priority? How do you prioritize the actions that you need to take that have been identified in the strategy? And prior to that, there's also the issue around gaps that you've identified. So there has to be a process of how you identify the gaps. And we've seen efforts from the likes of uh, the CMM model, which has been used in a number of countries to make sure that you can be able to identify gaps in a strategy and then be able to implement them. So the issue around having a strategy and how you go from a strategy to the implementation is also a very tricky aspect. So we need to think about prioritization. That's number one. The second issue also is the issue around the, the sustaining and how do you fund those tasks that have been identified. Many of the countries that we've dealt with have that particular problem of the funding, which is never discussed during the formulation of a strategy. We never call in 
the finance office, or we never call in the finance ministry, but we call them after a strategy has already been put in place. So therefore the funding is a big, big issue that needs to be considered. But moving forward, we are now seeing another trend that also is helping this particular process whereby donor agencies, funding agencies, developing partners, the private sector are trying to come together before advancing their assistance in whichever shape or form to these countries. And we've seen that through the, the global forum uh, for cyber experts. Uh, you know, that's another forum that the GFC forum is a good forum because what it does is that it puts all these people together in order to prioritize how to approach a specific problem that has been identified in some of the developing countries. But I think there's no doubt we have challenges, especially in a number of areas in these developing countries. One is the area of legal, the issues of uh, policy and regulation. That is a challenge that needs to be addressed. We have challenges when it comes to capacity development, how much capacity, the understanding of cybersecurity as an issue, that's another challenge. We have a challenge in terms of just the resilience, uh, which uh, again, the panelists talked about, Chris talked about it a little bit earlier, but the resilience of this particular infrastructure in these countries, that is something that needs to be looked at. And then of course, cooperation, both regionally, nationally and internationally, as talked about by, by our colleague there. That is another issue that needs to be looked at. And of course, the financial aspect, how do you sustain? How do you make sure that these strategies are implemented and how do we monitor and evaluate them? So those are the challenges that are there. But again, as we've said earlier, efforts such as the one that the ITU has put forward where consortiums and, 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 and organizations with experience come together to come up with a guide can be a good contribution. And it is a good contribution towards guiding some of these countries to understand what sort of areas to look at, what sort of issues to prioritize, and how to go about them, which is very, very important. Back to you, Nick. Thank you. And thank you. And thank you. And I, I, I think that's an excellent answer. And I think it really all comes back to uh, you know, what Sam was talking about regarding that gap analysis that I think all countries uh, you know, developing or otherwise really have to face. And I think one of the other issues that we are gonna have with this, I think is trust and confidence uh, you know, in implementing as well and, and or implementation as well. And so Irfan, I'm gonna turn to you on this because it's been reported that only 34% of managers actually have confidence in their team's ability to detect and respond to cyber threats. Now, this is due essentially to a general shortage of cybersecurity uh, skills and professionals globally. Uh, you know, I know we have that problem here in the United States. For example, 69% of managers state that their team are essentially understaffed and almost half of them have said that university graduates in cybersecurity are not prepared for the job challenges that they're going to face. I've actually seen that firsthand uh, with some of my work that I've done here with universities. Now, um, what is the role of uh, basically national CIRTs in addressing this gap? Uh, what are essential the essential skills and knowledge an incident response team must have, and how can these be developed? Uh, you know, just anywhere on the globe. So, so Nick, thank you for asking those uh, questions. I think I think they're really important and they get to the crux of the issue. Um, I think we can talk a lot about um, the different parts of cybersecurity. Uh, you know, the governance is important. International cooperation is important. I think when it comes down to it, as you and others will know, the work is done by people. Um, even when you are talking about technology or smart technologies or AI in the defense of uh, the digital economy, they're, they're put together by people. So I really can't stress enough how crucial uh, skills are to uh, a secure digital economy. Now, you mentioned a few gaps there. Um, in the UK, we, you know, have a similar kind of level of confidence in the, the ability of people um, that, that, that are training for these jobs, uh, but also that just the size of the gap. So uh, in the UK, we had something like 650,000 businesses that stated that they had a cybersecurity gap, and we have 120,000 um, cybersecurity posts that are difficult to fill. Now, it's amazing to think that that's the case when there is, uh, you know, an economy in, in the state that it, it is in. And, ha and, you know, this was similar 10 years ago when we were also in a downturn. So we really need to think about why is it that these jobs, which are high quality, high paying jobs, aren't attracting people into them? 
Um, I think uh, there, there's a few things here. You, you mentioned the role of CSERT uh, in, in, the set, in the skills uh, training of, of, of people into this um, profession. I, th I think it's broader than that. And, and we were talking, uh, and a few people mentioned the importance of strategy. And, uh, uh, Dr. Kajabi mentioned it just now, and it was spoken about right at the start, that strategy is a piece of paper that sits on a shelf. So the strategy is really there about is to get the various, you know, one of the things it does is it brings various stakeholders together. The CSER is one of those, um, industry is another, the training sector is another, and the education sector is another. And what a strategy can really do is bring those different strands together to actually, um, you know, get the desired result. I think one of the uh, issues that we see in the cyber skills sector is that it's really hard to navigate for businesses. Uh, and for uh, trainees and for for employees, it's you know there's no single standard of what you know what level you get to after a few years of training. And I think the 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 massive need over the last 15 years for cyber skills has led to a plethora of qualifications that you know it's difficult to navigate how to go from one to the other to the other. Um, and so actually being you know putting together a pathway for the cyber career. Um, and, and the cyber sector is really important uh, in, in allowing people to navigate uh, uh, those jobs. So, you know, there is an, uh, th there's also, and I touched on this earlier, how do you get more people thinking that cyber is a sector that they want to be in? I think the majority of, or many people look at the sector and say it's very technical, uh, it's for a certain demographic or a certain profile of person, and, that, and that's not me. Actually, uh, those of us that have worked in uh, 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 cyber have have seen a whole range of different people with different backgrounds working there. So, uh, you know, one is to make sure we get enough people into that talent pool to start with. Another one is to make sure that that talent pool knows where to go after the training. And then another one is to actually have the standards to make sure that what people are being trained at, uh, trained on, is is the right thing. Yeah, and I I think those are I think those are all really good points. Uh, you know, in, in that sense that we do have a limited pool in cybersecurity of those that are, I think, very interested in going into the field. Uh, but to, to your greater point, though, as we are training and developing, uh, you know, these individuals and putting them out into the workforce, whether it's the private or the public sector, I think it really might scream uh, or, or rather really might underscore the need uh, for, for organizational structure. And so Sam, I, I'd like to know uh, your thoughts on this, but what organizational structure or structures like bodies, agencies, et cetera, should countries be putting into place to ensure that their national cybersecurity strategy, implementation, monitoring and evaluation and everything else is constructively performed? Obviously, if we have a bit of a, a gap, if you will, in let's say the, the education, the training and the experience of, of uh, generation of cybersecurity professionals coming out of uh, college and, or university and going into the workforce that obviously uh, you know, we need to make sure that we are properly channeling them to ensure that we are uh, ensuring our national cybersecurity strategies. Nick, thank you. That is an excellent question. In my view, one of the big gaps we have in strategy is accountability for what we do. Not only does the strategy say we will do something, but it also says who will do it and with what resources and when it will be done. And if possible, what metrics will be used to determine if it has been done and if additional actions and additional resources are necessary to accomplish that part of the strategy. In terms of workforce development, I think this is a national issue. And it's a national issue both to develop people, to help people find the right opportunities, to sustain an educational process that continues to develop people, and that develops people not just for technology, but for operations, and for the continued development of policy and strategy. Um, in the U.S., we have a program called the, uh, the National uh, 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 Initiative for Cyber Education, or NICE, which is an effort, one that continues to evolve, that provides for government, national government guidance, but also is implemented at the state and the local level. 
I'm not saying that this is the model that every other country should use. What I am saying, however, is that particularly in workforce development, it's important that we develop people, but also make sure they have some place to work. I think Chris made that point that we have a gap of people and yet we're not necessarily finding them the right work. And at the same time, we also have to make sure that people have current skills that if we move to cloud, if we move to 5G, if we move to IoT, if we move to smart cities and smart infrastructure, that we understand the challenges of securing these new systems and technologies and infrastructures. And we continue in our workforce development efforts to ensure that people understand those challenges and have the right skills. So I would say that overall, there is uneven, uneven development around the world in cyber workforce development in particular, and in coupling that development to a country's national cyber policy and national cyber strategy. And strategy, if it assigns resources and responsibility and timelines and metrics can help close that gap. Yeah, and I think that's, that's a really good point. Uh, just in terms of developing that that national cybersecurity. And we actually have, I think, um, something that kind of dovetails with that rather well, a question from the audience. Vanessa uh, from uh, Brazil asks, metrics are an essential component of the strategies. Can you share good practices of metrics that you have identified in national strategies? And I'm thinking, Agvile, uh, just given your background, you might be a, a good one to answer that question for us. Well, uh, this is a really tricky question regarding the metrics. And as Chris mentioned at the beginning, so what are we measuring? And uh, are we looking at the number? Uh, because metrics need to be measurable, first of all. So are we looking at the number of a cyber incidents? And we have, if we have them more, more of cyber incidents, does it mean that we are better at our ability to detect them? Or does it mean that our strategy is not working? So, and this is also a big question at the UN where we manage uh, our UN Global Counterterrorist Program on Cyber and New Technologies, which um, assists uh, our member states in building capacities in three particular areas. So, and the question is always there. So how we measure the success of our capacity building programs, and it can be applied uh, the same to national cybersecurity strategies. What are, what are the good metrics? To see that. So first, of course, when de developing uh, metrics, one has to think about what they are trying to achieve in terms of policy and cybersecurity strategy and how to measure that. So number of cyber incidents could be, could be a metric, uh, but uh, what does it show? Does it show that we are better at detecting them or does it show that uh, our strategy is not working and you know all the international environment is getting more and more toxic and, and nations are not capable to do that i was thinking uh, about uh, you know uh, how to measure for example the effectiveness of um, law enforcement in uh, prosecuting cyber crime so one of the metrics uh, that could be used is to uh, to compare the actual um, cases that have been started uh, to investigate cybercrime and uh, actual prosecution, number of prosecutions, successful prosecutions of those cases, because uh, in this regard, it can show that we started the investigation and we were able to prosecute it, bring it to court. Evidence was uh, submitted and was acceptable. So we had good uh, electronic evidence uh, collection capabilities, digital forensic capabilities, maybe sharing of information between incident response teams and cybercrime units that also helped. So that could be a metric to, to do. In some cases, for example, certain elements of national cybersecurity strategy are important, like having whole of the government exercises, for example. So the metric could be, you know, the number of exercises held and the number of lessons identified. This could also help uh, to achieve uh, uh, a nation uh, 
better preparedness and better resilience because cyber exercises, they bring um, stakeholders together at the same table to, uh, to run different scenarios. And that could be a good metric, but uh, actually the metrics are tricky and it's difficult to develop. There are some good practices available how to develop them. And what, one that I'm aware of is ANISA's guide to development of cybersecurity strategies but I cannot give a very definite and clear answer what is a good metric. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. And uh, yeah, and it's actually, it's very interesting. And uh, Andrea actually just uh, posted in chat in a, as a response to Vanessa as well. And his last statement as something that um, we should be essentially joining forces on as an international community to, I think, create those standards is something that is, uh, you know, that's very important as well. And Chris, I just saw you, uh, you know, chimed in as well. But I think, though, uh, this actually dovetails when we are talking about resilience and all of that. And Andrea, I'd love for you to answer this question, uh, you know, kind of in that vein, just picking up where, where Vanessa's question left off. Because in order for a national cybersecurity strategy to essentially add value to the development of national cybersecurity strength and resilience, it's essential to elaborate a roadmap uh, you know, for its implementation. You know, we, we've talked about the gap analysis and all of that. At some point, we, we start planning for, for the implementation. And so what are some of the most important elements in terms of responsibilities, priorities, requirements, et cetera, to be taken into account when elaborating on that, that implementation plan? So we go back to some business points. I mean, I mean, it was very clear before saying, you know, you have the policy, you have the strategy, but then, you know, the most important thing is how you translate those principles and actions uh, into reality. So first of all, a, a, a great metric uh, to measure, you know, a strategy is, do you have a plan? And is that plan clear enough? I mean, identifying uh, which are the actors involved, uh, uh, the timelines, the budgets, uh, and talking about actors or, uh, and capabilities, if there's a clear identification of the stakeholders. You know, uh, um, I think that national cybersecurity or cybersecurity in general, because it's very difficult, you know, to create a boundary, a national boundary uh, 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 around cybersecurity is like a complex biological system. Is not protecting the system you know, from viruses, you know, we get in contact with viruses every day and we have an immune system that should be responding to that. And it's the same for nationals or, or in general, you know, cybersecurity related to national interests. You know, you need to allow a flourish economy. You need to allow digital services to be as interoperable as possible, but at the same way, you know, protecting them. The most difficult, uh, now, without using medical examples, because I'm not a doctor, you know, I understand a little bit of music, is like having, you know, the government should be playing the role of an orchestrator. First, in order to orchestrate, you need a group of musicians, a, a group of players. Uh, and the players are not only the government agencies. Every time we are asked by a government to come and support, uh, we find out that the government, most of the times, they don't have a dialogue, an intense dialogue with the private sector owners. And most of the times they own, they manage, and they deliver the national uh, uh, digital service or the national essential services. So first is recognizing the players. Second, there are players that are not national. I mean, what's the influencer to national security of big global players like the social media or the new uh, um, the new media platforms. I mean, they are be becoming closer and closer to an international organization or a government uh, uh, with its own governance. And they need to be recognized uh, as somehow relevant stakeholders. Third, you need to have a score, you know, okay, I have this a, a beautiful group of uh, talented musicians, and then what we're going to do. That's the plan, but the plan, you know, needs to be based on the music you want to hear. And that's how, at the end, 
you will judge the execution. You know, those are the metrics. Now, I suspect uh, it's more than a suspect. <laughs> I'm sure that uh, uh, most of the metrics I've seen are very tactical. It's like measuring cholesterol. Are we sure? Do we have real evidence that high cholesterol will lead to death? So there are some behaviors, some practices that we think might help national security, but we don't know yet. That's where, in my written comment in the chat, I'm suggesting that we need common frameworks uh, because we need to merge those compliance-based, old-fashioned uh, uh, metrics approaches to the new approaches that are based on massive data, artificial intelligence. Let me see you know, what I observe in real cybersecurity and compare it you know, with the final results. That's where we need international projects, uh, where we can provide a safe, and secure environment that will not threaten, you know, uh, uh, freedom of speech and privacy and personal security, but on the other side will help us as governments, you know, to improve. Let me just finish with the last comment. It's true that every government uh, has a different strategy, but if you look at most of the strategies and for the work I do, I very often end up doing benchmarks, comparing the different strategies 95% of the objectives are exactly the same. Sometimes there are very relevant differences, but let's forget those differences. Let's work together on the common objectives. That's where governments might work together to find common solutions. Yeah, and I, I think that just really underscores, and I love your analogy of the musicians because it takes all of us working together to make a concert. You know, and so I, I think that's that's a, a really good point. Now, um, Martin, I know you wanted to uh, jump in here real quick uh, for a minute or two, and uh, you know, add your thoughts onto that uh, particular question. So, uh, Martin, if you uh, if you would, yeah, please. just th yeah, thank you, Nick. Uh, uh, I was just listening to Andrea very carefully, and I know Andrea means well. It is true you need data for to, in order to know where where you are. But let me just take you two steps back. It also depends on the stage of the country. If a country, for example, is at this initial stages and we are calling it this ground zero, no strategy available, only policy, or even none of those, then I think the buildup is dependent on what you would consider the core factors. So for example, you would advise a country that look, you've got to look at your instruments of law. You've got to look at your policies. You've got to look at the regulation in order to allow you to have a strategy that has a, a focal point. Because if you don't have a mandate as an agency, you can't even start formulating that strategy in the first place. So the priorities are dependent on the stage of the country where it is. And if there's more data to go by, then you could use that data to fall back to that data to give you the measure of the priorities that are required. So for example, if a country wants to have a SAT, as a measure to make sure that they can be able to protect its infrastructure, then that could also get a priority. It could be, it could be prioritized based on the impact that SAT will have if something else went wrong. So therefore, the issue about the risks and the value of that risk if things go wrong could also help and shape how you determine the priorities. But some of them are, are very, very much uh, interlinked because they are more or less related to the legislation, to the policies that are in place, and even the mandate of the agencies that are supposed to conduct that. So I just wanted to bring that perspective, to, uh, I mean, the point. It depends on the stage and the information that you have moving forward in terms of prioritization. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I, I think that's obviously a really good point because some countries are gonna have a massive amount of data collection, others are not. Uh, you know, we have an entire path uh, you know, that we take from, from basics all the way to maturity that, that essentially I, I, I think is going to dictate where a country is. And I think this is actually a really good time to talk to uh, Pratima of uh, Bhutan as well, because, uh, you know, I think she's, her country, Bhutan, is going along this path right now. And so Pratima, I'd love to know um, what have been some of the main challenges that your country has encountered while developing its national cybersecurity strategy? And what mechanisms has your country put into place to ensure that the national cybersecurity strategy implementation is going to be successful? 
Um, thank you so much for the, for the question. Um, actually, uh, the challenges that we, ha we have faced and still we are facing are almost answered by all the panelists. So thank you so much to all the panelists. I, I'm enjoying the talk. <laughs> um, to, to begin my answer, let me just explain uh, you about my country, Bhutan, because I think uh, most of the participants in this virtual room may not have heard about Bhutan or may not have known about Bhutan at all. So uh, Bhutan is a small landlocked country and between, a uh, squeeze between China and India. And we have a population merely 700,000 people. Uh, we'll be soon graduating from the least developed country to a developing country. And um, a lot of credit goes to ITU, thank you. Um, ICT was introduced uh, two decades ago, and uh, so far we have progressed uh, so much in ICT adoption. Like in terms of mobile banking, we have uh, got less transactions. A uh, number of 3G and 4G network mobile subscriptions has uh, increased a lot, uh, which almost equals to the size of our population. Um, most government services are offered uh, online. Um, uh, there. Um, Hydropower sector is uh, one of the uh, highest uh, economic generating sector of our country, and they are also uh, adopting high-end uh, operation, operation technologies like um, GADA. And uh, even because of the pandemic, uh, most of the health and education services are also um, transitioning into uh, online digital platform. Uh, BTCERT, Bhutan Computer Incident Response Team, uh, was established uh, uh, four and a half years ago in 2016. And the cybersecurity journey began uh, with the readiness assessment conducted by ITU uh, in 2012. BTCERT, uh, we function under the Department of IT and Telecom uh, within the government of the town. And we are mandated to provide uh, both the uh, reactive as well as proactive uh, cybersecurity services to the entire nation. Uh, the initiation of the development of cybersecurity strategy, uh, it happened uh, towards the end of 2018 um, through ITU support. Dr. Marco Gerg visited the country and uh, provided us a rough NCS draft, initial draft. Um, however, the first draft of NCS, the actual finalization of the uh, NCS was been able to complete only this year, a few months ago. So uh, we are, uh, at, at, the, at the moment, we are awaiting public consultation. And after that, uh, the NCS uh, National Cyber Safety Strategy document will be submitted to the cabinet of Bhutan for the approval. So as the, uh, as the EO gap demonstrates, we did face quite a number of challenges in the process. Uh, among many other difficulties, the most difficult were on uh, explaining the importance of cybersecurity and the necessity of cybersecurity strategy. Like our leaders, mostly they are non-IT background and in a country where adoption of ICT is a work in progress, uh, educating cybersecurity is another bigger challenge. Um, senior ma management perceive that the cybersecurity is a problem with technology when it is actually more than that. Uh, the other challenge was the support and buy-in from stakeholders. Uh, NCS caters to all sectors, in fact, to the entire country, and uh, uh, for it to for NCS to come as a comprehensive and inclusive, we needed involvement and uh, collaboration from all sectors. It was challenging in the beginning to bring everyone on board. Uh, first problem, the second was also in uh, very difficult to come into one consensus. The other main challenge was the, because uh, being us very uh, small country and also we are we are very young democracy, we have uh, limited cybersecurity capacity and capability. So within the country, we have very few, um, we can count from in, in our fingers, we have uh, very num few number of cybersecurity professionals uh, and uh, NCS requires a lead uh, who has a complete uh, understanding of the entire ICT ecosystem. So in the start, there were difficulties in getting a clear direction of the strategy like uh, prioritization of activities. Uh, being inexperienced, we felt all the domains of cybersecurity uh, were important because there were cases where uh, cybersecurity incidents were happening. The awareness was another, uh, another uh, domain 
and then uh, technical development of tec technical skills was the other. So it, there was lots of confusion in the beginning. Um, coming back to your uh, part uh, two, the second question, uh, we also feel that uh, we've had, we have come a long way. So uh, we are hoping that once the uh, NCS document gets approved by the cabinet, we feel that implementation would be smoothly, though it's uh, easier said than done. Uh, because we already have a high-level ICT steering committee, which is composed of uh, top-level management from both the public uh, and uh, private sector. And that uh, committee is chaired by the Prime Minister of Bhutan. So our plan is that the implementation of NCS will be stayed by this body. Uh, we have also secured a budget roughly around uh, 7 million USD, uh, which is less. But uh, if we uh, convert it, the equivalent is... Um, milled on 50 million. Uh, that budget is for identifying critical information infrastructure. We haven't done at the moment. So that's in, in, in the plan. Um, we, uh, the budget is also for conducting cybersecurity awareness and also in developing capacity and capability within the country. Um, the other, uh, we are also, we are trying to ensure that the, the strategy will be successful because we have identified the stakeholders and their responsibilities. Uh, now in the plan, we have uh, identified a creation of three groups, um, like uh, the legal group will be uh, composed of uh, um, uh, stakeholders from LEA, law enforcement agencies, who will be looking after the cybersecurity legislation of Bhutan. The other group is the child online protection group uh, will be composed of education sector, uh, ISPs uh, and, uh, and CSOs. So they will come up with uh, the COP guidelines. And the third group is the technical group, which will be composed of uh, people from the experts, uh, mostly technical experts from the critical uh, sectors, as well as from academia and uh, other technical experts. So the first task that we have identified for now is the development of baseline security, uh, specific to uh, CIA agencies, as well as uh, other non-CI agencies and SME, uh, small and medium enterprises. So um, other uh, monitoring will be, the plan is the monitoring of uh, NCS implementation will be conducted by BTCERT uh, monthly. And if any issue arises, that will be escalated to the high level steering committee. So we feel that uh, we are really hoping high that once the NCS gets approved, we will uh, kick start with the implementation by formation of this group. So that's that's all that I have to say for now. Uh, we uh, we haven't implemented, so I think more lessons will be learned once we start implementing. So that's all for now. Thank you. And thank you, and thank you. And I think that's just a really interesting insight, Pratima, into Bhutan and and where they're at, and also you know lessons that you learn right as as you develop the strategy and you begin that implementation process and I think that actually really dovetails rather well with a question uh, from the audience, just overall in general, uh, regarding uh, essentially motivation and encouragement. And Chris, I think uh, just given your background in first, I think this would be really interesting uh, to hear your response to. Uh, thanks again, Pratima. Um, but the question uh, from Adi from the audience is one of the most important things uh, explained in the discussion was how to encourage the involvement of all stakeholders, government, private sector, et cetera, to implement a defined strategy. Uh, can you explain, Chris, how the best way to foster engagement uh, for all of these stakeholders is? That's a really, really good question. And, and I'll, I'll try and explain yeah. it both from sort of a first point of view and, and from some of my previous experience. So first believes in is a you know is always all about collaboration and, and helping people build a better world, but that requires people to have bought in in the first place. So you know, we're already talking about people who want to do good stuff and now they're joining an organization that allows them to talk to other people with a similar mindset and with a similar, similar um, desire to improve things. I think as we look at this in a national CSER, realm where you're you're in a country and you're trying to encourage academia and private business and government and civil society and so on to do the same thing that's a very different space um, and it's something the UK government has, has wrestled with over the years I'm, I'm sure our family will will jump in on this at some point 
when I was part of that world, which is, I think I left that world about four years ago, um, originally we had tried very much on the let's encourage people to do good things let's let's build an environment where they can join let's let's build an environment they can share information but we're not we're very much sort of using a carrot less and not so much of a stick there was a big theory that or a big you know worry that if we regulated things it would become a sort of a tick box environment. You know, have you got a firewall? Yes. Well, having a firewall doesn't make you secure. It just means you've got a box. If it's configured correctly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that makes you secure. So, so for a long time, there was this, well, we can't regulate, but we will encourage through natural things. And there was a lot of work done on helping businesses see an improvement to their bottom line. So, so cyber insurance. So, you know, being able to insure some of your losses. If you, if a company was good, it should get cheaper insurance. Therefore, it, there's, a, there's a bottom line hit to that company's profitability, which hopefully incentivizes them to do things. Similar things with say bank loans. If you're, if you're, if you're a very good cyber company, maybe you get a cheaper bank loan. Your money is, you know, that loan is more safe and so on. That's a very niche area to work in. It doesn't really help in a lot of areas. Um, you know, I look at lots of sectors in the UK where, you know, the medical sector, that our National Health Service, hugely important, hugely amazing gang of people. If you give a doctor a million pounds, is he going to buy an MRI scanner or is he going to buy more cybersecurity stuff to keep people safe? That's a real challenge to, to work through. And I get that that's difficult. So for a long time, we, were, we, 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 we held off using any form of stick on this. Um, just as towards the end of my time in government, the, the GDPR sort of hove into view. British government, obviously part of the EU at the time, was very interested in how that worked. And we saw that as a very natural way to encourage people to do better. Because it actually meant that if they did badly, then they, there, were, there were punishments, um, you know, there were fines, there were, there were hits to bottom lines, etc. And it also put the power sort of back where it should be, which is, the British government's view is it's a business's problem to be cyber secure and run a secure business and be resilient and 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 be cyber safe and whatever. And if they're not, then the customer should move and go somewhere else. So again, you're trying to drive that bottom line figure. That works quite well in business. I still, you know, it's still a challenge in, in say, the National Health Service. It's still a challenge in, in charity sectors and so on. But it is very difficult to encourage people to do this properly. But there has been a bit of a sea change away from that. Let's just hope people are going to be good into actually we're going to start forcing them. We're going to start driving them to be good through the regulation side of the world. But very much based on best practices, very much based on, you know, common common standards and so on, rather than you should have a firewall. You know, you should be resilient or you should be secure to the level that everybody would expect. And if you can't prove that, then we'll give you a bigger fine. Uh, BA just got fined for um, you know, some issues they had a couple of years ago. They were one of the first to be hit with a reasonably big fine. Um, it was a 20 million pound fine. So, so that some of those are coming through. It certainly was something that when I worked in the private sector, it, it focused the board's view very closely. The thought that they could lose 4% of their global turnover, potentially, is, is makes a board certainly think about cybersecurity. But again, that's very focused on private sector, industry, you know, companies that with businesses and so on. How do you encourage society to be more secure is a real challenge. Um, we tried to do that by lots of awareness, lots of explanations, lots of collaboration sharing and help and, the, and changing what was a, the previous perception of government was that government was only interested in taking information from the private sector about cyber stuff. We, when we, when we built CERT, our model was that unless we couldn't, we would always share back with the private sector. So trying to genuinely build a partnership with the private sector rather than just being a, a receptacle of information. So building that trust through working together, I think was, was the other piece. Yeah, and and I actually think that's a really good point because I in this day and age, data really can't move one way, especially when we're talking about things like threat intelligence. Uh, you know, and I also can't tell you how many times I've walked into, including massive organizations that say, "Well, we've got an antivirus and a firewall. We do cybersecurity." <laughs> you know, it's a it's a very common misconception I think the world over, and it's something that 
really needs to be addressed. But uh, Sam, I, I want to ask you this question, though, because, uh, you know, I think uh, just to, to, to expand on what Chris was talking about here, what is the added value of engaging uh, society in the implementation of a national security strategy? And how can this engagement and obviously future ones as well, be more inclusive, more collaborative in terms of needs, orientations and perspectives from uh, essentially a wide variety of cybersecurity stakeholders, both public and private? Thank you, Nick, uh, for that question. Um, there are several things that can be done and several advantages that can be gained. First, there is a need to engage all of society. If people don't practice good cybersecurity individually, and if they don't have good knowledge about what to do, why to do it, and why it is important, it may not happen. There is a discouraging um, set of anecdotes. And as we say, the plural of anecdote does not equal data. But in this case, perhaps it does, that a lot of old exploits continue to work because people don't take enough care and the organizations for which they don't work don't take enough care. We've seen some ransomware attacks against cities using ransomware that has been around for a long time, and yet it continues to work, even though mitigation is possible. So good education among stakeholders at the enterprise level, the government level, the corporate level, the individual working unit level, and the individual level, I think is important. This is another reason why I think metrics can be important because when people say, so what? So there's a problem. Does it really affect my company? Does it really affect my government ministry? The answer is yes, and here's the evidence. We talked earlier about metrics. There are generally two kinds. Inputs, and Chris Gibson, uh, you, you mentioned one, you know, do we have a firewall? These are inputs, what we are doing. The other are outputs, what result we're getting. An input is how much am I spending for you know, a kilogram of cybersecurity. The output is, and what, did, and what benefit did I get? Metrics are slowly, slowly becoming available. And the improvement in metrics is an area where I urge more international cooperation. For example, the cybersecurity insurance industry is beginning slowly to understand what cybersecurity losses are occurring, and they need to understand because they can't price cybersecurity insurance if they don't. We are beginning to get some data, both in the US and internationally and globally, about the effects of cybersecurity ransomware, of how much is being held at ransom and what companies are paying. If law enforcement works globally, together, transparently, we can improve the quality, the quantity and quality of data relating to ransomware, both um, in terms of, of what is happening and how much is, is being paid. If we have that information and we disseminate that information, we can do a better job of explaining to people what they have at stake and what they need and, and what they need to do about it. Let me make one other point. Um, also explaining to people what to do could, be, could benefit from having a good common structure, whether or not it's the cybersecurity maturity model or the cybersecurity framework from the National Institute of Standards and Technology here in the States, but having a logical way of structuring a program that is easy to understand and commonly understood would be another way of helping people demystify a very complex subject. This does not have to be mysterious. It can be explained clearly, good metrics, good international cooperation to develop those metrics and common frameworks to develop cybersecurity programs can help. Yeah, and I think those are, those are all really good points. 
uh, in the sense that having a framework like NIST, for example, 800, which you mentioned, or, or the new CMMC uh, for the US government, uh, those kinds of things, I, I think, do indeed demystify it for a lot of organizations and give them that foundational roadmap, that framework that they can start snapping in uh, you know, their, their, their execution and implementation of a, of a project on. I think that's a really good point. Uh, you know, we actually have, I think, uh, a question that dovetails uh, essentially pretty good with that uh, from the public. And Agvile, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, and the question is, according to the accountability of the cybersecurity strategy, um, who do you think should play a role in ensuring that accountability, that cyber strategy is implemented as expected? Uh, you know, just if, if Sam is talking about the frameworks that we're going to use for the guidelines, uh, how are we assuring the accountability of who is basically going to be executing that for us? Yes, um, thank you for this question. A very good uh, question. It relates to the governance mechanism within the country. So there's no one, no one answer who is accountable for that. Um, at the end of the day, it's probably the government. If, it, if, if it's approved at the government level, it could be the parliament um, if it is approved as a, as a piece of legislation. But uh, in terms of accountability, it is very important to establish the mechanism of governance of the cybersecurity strategy uh, and uh, monitoring and evaluation mechanism. So if a, a country has a cyber national cybersecurity strategy together with the implementation plan, so at the lowest level, a lot of uh, public agencies, maybe private actors, would be responsible and accountable for the implementations of, of a particular pieces of uh, elements of national cybersecurity strategy that they were assigned to or agreed to implement. Uh, at the higher level, uh, some countries choose to have uh, some kind of interagency steering mechanisms where they discuss uh, the ways, uh, the progress achieved, what has been done, what are the delays, whether there is a need to revise a plan of action because it is not, not working, uh, there's a lack of funding. So to sum it up, uh, each country has its different strategic frameworks. And in terms of accountability, there's should be a specific agreement and understanding within the government who is accountable for the overall implementation of the strategy. And of course, it comes together with the resources. So who is assigned the resources for the implementation of a national cybersecurity strategy? Because as we started at the beginning, and I think Andrea had mentioned, so if there are no resources, financial resources attributed to that, how you can implement, implement those actions. So yeah, so uh, um, in short, uh, these are my thoughts and thank you for the question. Uh, and thank you. And I, I think those are really good points. Uh, and I think it also actually, interestingly enough, dovetails with another question uh, from the audience, which just wonderful questions. Please feel free to keep them coming. We'll try to get them going, but we're gonna actually pivot a little bit. And I think this dovetails uh, with your answer, Agvile, but Irfan, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this uh, because one of the things that we've talked about, um, I think in the last few years in the cybersecurity community, I know either when I'm on stage, I'm getting questions on this, or if I'm in the audience, somebody is talking about it, and that is the supply chain. And one of the questions that we have from the audience is, many countries are including their national cybersecurity principles aspects related to the development of supply chain controls and homegrown technologies to be developed in critical services. How important uh, is it to include such an aspect for developing countries, and what are the best practices uh, in this direction? I think that's a great question. I think it's a really good question. Uh, it's a really important one, and and the timing couldn't have been better. Um, I, I think uh, the panel represents a number of different countries, all of which have uh, very different views on this. So I, I don't think there is an answer on this yet. I think everyone is trying to do their own thing, um, and and this is still happening across the world. I, I would say this is this has become really uh, important in the last uh, couple of years as we've become a bit more aware of um, what uh, su supply chain security means for not just uh, critical national infrastructure, but for businesses. So um, some of this will depend on, uh, you know, how uh, reliant you are on external technologies, um, what you consider to be a trusted supplier, uh, and what those actual vulnerabilities are. Remember that these are not um, kind of 
esoteric concepts that we're talking about. We are talking about disruption of services. Um, so, so supply chain is one way to look at risk, and and that's a risk a set of risks across the economy. But of course, you know, your cybersecurity strategy can't be reliant on one thing or another. So, supply chain might be one one area, but you know, managing risk and being able to recover from cyber threats is an important one as well. Um, you know, having the the skills and industrial base in the country to be able to rebuild after an attack is important as well. Uh, and just because um, you you have certain protocols over supply chain does not mean that you are risk free. And I think that that's that in itself is a is a risk. Relying on you know at the silver bullet um, of something that's high profile at the moment and take your attention uh, off other things. I think the other thing we need to remember is. You know, there, there's a, a huge trade-off here. So we talk about the importance of cybersecurity, particularly post-COVID, because we're much more reliant on technologies now than we were seven months ago. I think what the last seven months has also told us is that our technologies are quite resilient. There, there's very few stories around the world of entire sectors of industry switching off. Uh, people have largely been able to continue their work. They've largely been able to adapt to new circumstances. And it is, it is because our technology is resilient. So th there's a trade-off here on how much you want to encourage growth uh, and how much you want to, um, you know, make sure you have all of your bases covered. And that's why we talk about cyber in terms of risk management, um, because they are, there are trade-offs and th this is about prioritizing. Right. And I think that's that's an excellent answer. And I think it covers a lot of the basis. Uh, you know, in my own experience, one of the things that I see where supply chain assurance is lacking is in contingency planning, you know, for for that exact event. Uh, and I think the world really needs to start focusing on on building that awareness and supply chain into the contingencies uh, with that. But I, I also think that that and Andrea, I, I think this is would be a great question for you here. But um, let's talk and pivot real quick to ICT, because given the pervasive nature of information and communication technology or ICT throughout the world, an ongoing issue for policymakers is essentially how to best define a cybersecurity strategy that works for the benefit of the government, of industry, as, as uh, you know, was just mentioned, not to mention civil society as well. So how can governments elaborate approaches on the at basically the strategic level to balance uh, you know, accepted norms of a country with the opportunities presented by the internet, which I think really dovetails on the, onto the supply chain issue uh, you know, very well? Yeah, and it's connected to the statement I made before that, uh, you know, identifying borders uh, in internet or cyberspace or ICT infrastructures, now it's, uh, it's impossible. Uh, um, uh, so first of all, I don't have the solution. I don't have the recipe. I can only help governments, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, identifying and better understanding all these variables. Uh, um, first is understanding that there's not national ICT. I know that many governments are, uh, in particular, some large governments uh, uh, um, are focusing the attention on uh, technical or uh, ICT sovereignty. Uh, but the reality is that we live in a global world. We live in a, in a connected world uh, when even some large countries uh, or very large countries, they struggle to deal with the dynamics of the ICT market if they work in isolation. Uh, uh, if we look, you know, what's going on in 5G, I, 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 even, you know, the largest countries are, you know, struggling uh, um, um, uh, um, to deal with the problem by themselves and they're looking to build, you know, political alliances or alignments uh, to try to push what they think it's, you know, in, in, in their eyes, the right move to do. So uh, um, um, I think it's important for most governments, if not all, to uh, um, recognize um, that in, when dealing with technology, there are no borders. And there are not only the, techno the technology vendors, there are multiple dimensions that overlap with very different boundaries. You have international regulators, because sometimes you know, a problem might be solved uh, not by a technological vendor, but by a standardization body or by an international organization or by a group of companies that are heavy users of those technologies and they might drive 
you know, changes uh, in that specific technology. Things are becoming worse now with IoT. Uh, uh, why? Because the number, you know, of connections uh, is exponentially increasing, uh, and you can define in a precise way uh, a subset of the global digital ecosystem. So uh, um, uh, again, I'm not giving the solution because I don't have it. Uh, uh, I can only uh, um, uh, uh, recommend, you know, first of all, not to do damages, uh, to stop uh, and understand the complexity of the ecosystem and all the players involved. Second, engage the, uh, um, as many actors as possible, not only the national actors. Uh, uh, sometimes, or most of the times, the national actors uh, have limited tools. And that's where governments working together makes a lot of sense because you know when dealing with global problems like you know security of core interoperable infrastructures it's not something that a single government can manage by itself even the european union you know 27 countries together they struggle you know they have of course more power than the single member state but yet if they try to fight the problem uh, or address the problem by themselves it, we already seen the results, you know, it's not enough. Right. And, and I think that's, that's a really good point that you make it. It really does at the end of the day, come down to that collaboration, that communication between different governments, different entities and all of that. And I think, uh, you know, there are different forms, I think, of communication that we need to uh, really address here because one is again that collaboration uh, globally that we need to have on this. But the other one, or the other part of this, and Chris, I'm I'm looking to you and first to answer this question: Is communication during a crisis or during an incident? Because when cyber attacks occur, there's a wide variety of stakeholders involved in managing the crisis, including things like operators, civil society, governmental agencies, and on and on and on. And so, how can communication during a crisis be improved? How can coordination between different stakeholders be beneficial for the overall capability to essentially deal with and absorb incidents? I think that's a really, really good question. Um, and it's something we, we struggle with all the time in incidents with, with who, who, who gets the message out, you know, who's the point person, who can speak, who can't speak. So again, I'll, I'll draw back on my experience with Insert UK. We were the, the designated national incident management organization and the reason that, that that changed from sort of the previous world of physical contingencies and challenges was that in those days, a lot of that was government controlled. And as, as we someone pointed out earlier, you know, in, in the UK, 85 percent of the critical national infrastructure is not owned by the government. The government doesn't understand how it works. The government has no control over it. And frankly, if you were one of those companies, you don't really want government people coming in to help you fix it because government doesn't know it well enough to do so. So we, want, we had to work out a way of bridging both the government side of information, and, and obviously there are various sources of information, both within the, within the UK government, but also you know, governmental relations with other countries around the world, but also bring in the private sector piece into an environment that up until then had been solely government. You know, the, the UK's crisis management construct, essentially you may have heard it, it's called, a thing called COBRA, it's a, it's a briefing room in the cabinet office, is a very government thing. You, there's no private sector in there. I don't know that they've ever been in there. Um, and that was a real challenge. Based off of, oddly enough, the Olympics, when, when Britain had the Olympics in 2012, they, they set up a, they realized there that this was going to be a challenge and they needed to meld both government and private sector and, and, and so on together. And they built what they called the OCT, the Olympic Cyber Coordination Team, I think it was. And that was the model we used. So what we did as, as the CERT was, although we called ourselves a CERT, to be fair, in the strict interpretation of what a CERT is, we weren't. We were an information sharing and analysis center with a coordinating role as well. That's what we did. So we got information in, we, you know, we talked to all the players, we would get that information in, and my job was to go and sit in, in, in that meeting with whoever was in charge and explain the single truth. Yeah, this is what we know now. This is that we've taken all the data from all of these separate bits of government and private sector, and we built this one report. This is what we're doing. And that's so critical in a crisis to have that one single voice telling you what the challenges is. Now, the, 
government construct that is not so much to fix the problem, although they want to, the government challenge really is to fix the outcomes of that problem. So if someone, for instance, you know, hacks a power station and turns it off, government obviously wants to turn it back on, but what they're really interested in is how that is affecting the civil population. Is that causing, you know, shops to close, traffic lights to fail, people to die in hospitals and so on. That's what government is trying to solve more than how do we fix the problem to turn the power station back on. Obviously in that case it's fairly binary, but, but there's a lot more about managing the outcomes of these things. And again, at that point, having that single voice going in, telling what the problem is, really critical. So we did that essentially through a lot of awareness, a lot of talking to people, a lot of making sure that that role was absolutely, you know, black and white defined. This is what our role is. When there is an incident, we are the people who talk in this meeting, not you, not you, not you, you know, no one else, it's us. You have to come to us. So we would manage those incidents very strongly to make sure that we weren't getting multiple messages. I'm always open for a debate about what the message is, but what I don't want is multiple people talking into into the, that single point, you know, that government construct with, well, we think it's this and we think it's this. And for, you know, at some point you have to make that cl clear. The second thing to do is to do a lot of exercises. Um, you, 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 you exercise, you train, you rinse, you repeat, you modify, you improve every time you learn better. And every time people will see the benefits of that, that very structured information gathering and reporting structure. And that again, almost came down to awareness again. So as part of what we did, we reached out certainly to the critical national infrastructure and over time much more out to the to the, the supply chain to explain what our role was, why we were here. We had a collaboration platform that we could use to talk to them and to gather that information. But it is, it sounds very boring, but it is really, you, you have to be structured in doing this. You cannot just have someone turn up and, and wing it in these cases. Cyber moves too fast, it scales too fast, it's too international none of these things are helped by having confused messages at the top. Right, I can, and I completely agree. I, <clears throat> one of the things about cybersecurity, unlike I would say standard technology, is that we oftentimes have to pivot on a dime you know, I like to say we don't we never know when that 15 year old kid is going to hack Google and now the entire game has been changed by virtue of nobody thinking of, you know, this particular, uh, you know, methodology before, uh, you know, but I also think it speaks to, you know, what you were saying about, you know, the government just doesn't necessarily understand, uh, you know, about, let's say, things like, like be becoming an internet service provider or how that communication works. It's dealing with the private sector. And so, Sam, I actually want to pivot to you on this, uh, speaking of pivoting, because you've obviously worked with probably one of the largest and most confederated and complex governments, you know, on the planet, which is the United States, which, you know, I think in and of itself has a lot of different challenges when you have so many moving parts and aspects to a national government, any national government. And so, Sam, what are some of the main challenges and obstacles preventing governments from ensuring effective monitoring and evaluation for the implementation of a national cybersecurity strategy? Thank you, Nick. Great question. Um, there are several challenges a national government will have. And one of those challenges is to get reliable information um, about who is doing what, um, when it is being done, how effective it is. One lesson that we have learned is that having good industry and technology specific information sharing and analysis uh, uh, organizations or information uh, sharing and analysis centers can be useful. It brings together an industry, energy or transportation or financial services or healthcare so that they share information. It also provides a mechanism for them to share information with government and for them to receive from the government information about current threats and what works. Now, this isn't perfect. Government is not always in a position to share the most sensitive information. And sometimes industry is worried about sharing information with government that might include uh, personally identifiable information. And we have in, in our country uh, had to contend with these and very difficult issues. On the other hand, I think we're doing better. We are seeing that, that information sharing is approving in specific industries and across industries that are working on things like IoT and smart infrastructure. 
that sharing is also leading us to identify some of the gaps that have to be uh, that have to be that have to be closed. Sometimes we don't know enough about the vulnerability of systems that use AI or the vulnerability of systems with large attack surfaces because of numerous IoT devices, perhaps as many as 1 million IoT devices per square kilometer. I want to, however, focus my answer a little bit more on developing countries, countries that are only now building a, uh, a, a, an advanced information and communications technology infrastructure, their own cyber ecosystem, and that may not have had in the past the resources necessary to build up a cybersecurity ecosystem to support their IT ecosystem. I would recommend that these companies, that these countries, the developing countries sp pay special attention um, as they develop new IT infrastructures and new smart cities infrastructures and make those investments or uh, have access to their investments, they should ask what information is, is, is on what, what information is collected in these infrastructures? Who secures that infrastructure? How is the governance of that security going to be managed? Asking these questions early can help put in place the policy and strategy architectures that developing countries also need. And in doing so, they can avoid some of the gaps that perhaps the industrial countries experienced because we didn't look at this soon enough. So Nick, I hope that answer is helpful to you. It is, it is. And I, I think it actually, really starts to dovetail into what is going to be the last question uh, in our discussion just due to time limits in terms of actionable items and things that uh, you know, we can start implementing and really looking at as well. And so Agvile, you get the honor of having the very last question that uh, I'm going to be giving here uh, today. And so I, I essentially want to talk about uh, effective policing in cyberspace because it's driven by information. So when an incident uh, occurs in, uh, in some way, shape or form, that information must be promptly accessible to law enforcement uh, you know, and other organizations that need it. So to what extent um, you know, uh, basically have uh, nations developed information sharing mechanisms between cybersecurity bodies such as CERTs, SOCs, uh, national cybersecurity agencies, and law enforcement. And in terms of actionable, what are best practices, do you think, in this direction? How does this improve the overall cyber resilience? And you get the final word. So thank you. Thank you, Nick. And I'm very honored to, <laughs> to have this final word. Uh, in our very interesting discussion um, about uh, policing and cyber domain. So incident response teams, they work on uh, preventing and mitigating cyber incidents. Law enforcement works on uh, reducing the number of threat actors that uh, incident response teams do not care that much. But sharing of the information between the two is a very crucial aspect in helping both CSERTs and law enforcement to achieve their, their objectives because information can feed to one organization's works and to the others. So CSERTs, they don't, do not have the powers of law enforcement vis-a-vis uh, -vis private actors and uh, regarding attacks of the criminal nature have an important role to play in investigation and in secure, especially in securing electronic evidence as they are the first responders when something in, uh, a big incident is happening and uh, they're dealing with a lot of information it is very important that in terms of the prosecution of a crime if it is a crime not just a, an incident uh, evidence is not deleted and it is uh, maintained in, uh, in line with the, with the standards that will be later admissible to court. So in terms of sharing information across the countries, it is getting better. Uh, law enforcement organizations uh, work with incident response teams and vice versa. But uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, legal and policy context play an important role, how it is implemented on a national level. So especially important is how a nation shares evidence with other countries, 
how the nation, uh, nation or the country is uh, engaged in international cooperation, which organizations it cooperates, which uh, countries it cooperates and shares information. What are data protection standards? Because a lot of information after the adoption of uh, GDPR within the European Union is attributable as a personal identifiable information and certs so um, have a lot of that information and have a regulation whether it can be shared. Uh, another important element to think uh, for nations when developing uh, mechanisms for information sharing between law enforcement and CSERTs is uh, how cybercrime is de defined. So what is the scope and the mandate to share that information? So these are, I think, um, important elements for the nations to think and uh, when developing uh, regulation policies or, or national cybersecurity strategies to think you know, whether it should be a voluntary or whether the nation should put a requirement for the CSA to report suspicious activities to the law enforcement when discovered during the incident. So there's one question for a nation to think about. Uh, do certs will, will, will uh, your national or, or sectorial incident response team pl will play a, a role in criminal investigation? For example, by providing technical experience, because they are most uh, technically experienced uh, people at the national level uh, in courts and supporting evidence collections. What will be the rules for that? And from the law enforcement side, it is also very important to make sure that it is not a one way street. So how law enforcement will ensure the secrecy investigation and will help uh, uh, see certs in their work that they are doing. And uh, and yeah, I think these are the bullets I, I wanted to, to mention upon, which I think are important in devising uh, policies and strategies and enforcing uh, a cooperation and information sharing between law enforcement agencies and see certs. But to, to build that, uh, I, I, I believe the most important element is trust, how each organization trusts each other. Uh, transparency, knowing how information will be used if it is shared and, um, and the need to enhance that uh, cooperation if we want to address and reduce the number of threat actors on the internet is very important. So that would that would be my answer. And thank you for, for the question and final question. And thank you. And I think that is a great way to end it. And real quick, we're gonna take an extra 10 minutes just to, to wrap this up. So interpreters, if you could stay on for another uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, we're just gonna give every panelist uh, a, a quick word uh, real quick. But, but thank you to everybody for attending. Uh, obviously, thank you to the panelists, just some excellent conversations. This is definitely gonna be the highlight of my week, I'm sure, there's no doubt of that. And um, make sure that everybody, uh, you check out Mural as well. You can see it here shared on the screen, but uh, you know, there's a lot of really good points that are that are being made on that. And the last thing I want to do, uh, you know, as we're wrapping up here, is essentially to to uh, give every panelist the ability to tell them, or, or rather, tell you uh, how you can find them in the world, whether that's LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever that is. And so, with that, uh, Andrea, if you would start us, uh, how can people find you if they want to contact you or get more information from you? So I, I, I'm very active in the international community. So if you go on, you know, LinkedIn, you know, you find me. Uh, you find my name on many. Uh, uh, ITU projects and uh, initiatives or in the chat I will drop you know my email address of course you know I work for a private company but I'm doing a lot of work uh, um, for international organizations uh, uh, you know contributing to the development of new strategies new initiatives in cybersecurity so always very happy to connect uh, with other people as I said I truly believe in joining forces Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just your answers are absolutely fantastic. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, with that, Sam, how can people get a hold of you uh, if they want to learn more or ask you a question? Thank you, Nick. I'm easy to find. My email address is svisner at mitre, M-I-T-R-E dot org. Um, I'm also active on LinkedIn. One can look at MITRE's uh, webpage and also at Georgetown University. 
uh, for uh, cybersecurity activities in which uh, I am I am involved. Um, if you are a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, as I am, I also post occasionally to the Council on Foreign Relations members wall. So as I said, I'm pretty easy to find. I'm active on social media and I'm active as well in the print media regarding social, uh, cybersecurity. Thank you. And thank you, thank you. Uh, Chris, why don't you go next? How can we learn more about you? So, so if you want to learn more about FIRST, it's very simple. It's www.first.org. Uh, my email address is chris at first.org. So very easy to find. I'm on LinkedIn as well. I'm, I'm on a bunch of places, but those two will find me very quickly. All right. I don't think I'll ever remember that for the record, but <laughs> Chris at first.org. First Come on. Fair enough. <laughs> Complicated Fair stuff. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Uh, Agvile, how, how can we get a hold of you or, or learn more about you? Yeah, um, I'm active also on LinkedIn. So, and I will be moving to New York in two weeks. So, if uh, the participants are from the member states, uh, I can be contacted through their permanent missions. But just um, um, and also, if there is a capacity building assistance uh, from the Office of Counterterrorism in, in terms of um, preventing and countering terrorist use of new technologies and cyber. So, permanent missions are also the channel to request that capacity building assistance from the UN. All right, thank you, thank you. Uh, and I believe uh, Irfan actually dropped due to connection issues. So Irfan, if you're here, speak up. Uh, if not, we'll move on. So uh, Pratima, let's go to you. If people want to learn more about uh, you and Bhutan and everything else, where, where can they find you? Um, I'm in LinkedIn as well, but I think, uh, why should anybody know about me? Uh, I will drop my email ID here. So, really, yes. LinkedIn and uh, my email ID. So sorry, that's not. There's a typo. E to couple B. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, to everyone. And thank you. Thank you. And. Uh... Martin, if everybody wants to learn about what you're doing or follow you, where can we find you? Uh, just like any other person, I'm very active on uh, LinkedIn. I will drop an email at the chat, along the chat, for everyone to get a hold of me. We do a lot of work within the Commonwealth. I'm sure some of the members on the line, uh, members that we've uh, interacted with at different uh, platforms. Internationally, I do quite a bit with the IT as usual, and also uh, with uh, many uh, Commonwealth countries that we do a lot of development work and within the UK. So I'll do that. And thank you so much for the invite and for the opportunity. And thank you. And thank you. And I do believe that wraps us up. Uh, most of the panelists have, have put their email addresses or other forms uh, you know, in, uh, in the chat. You can find me at Nick AESP on Twitter or uh, slash Nick Espinoza on LinkedIn. And I put my email in the chat as well. So please feel free to drop me a line if you need anything from me as well. And uh, I believe this wraps us up. I, I'd like to thank uh, the ITU uh, for basically putting this together so we could discuss national cybersecurity strategy, one, probably one of the most important things that the world is addressing and tackling today. And so uh, once again, thanks to everybody uh, that participated. Thanks to everybody that, that followed along, that asked us questions and uh, will contact us in the future. We really appreciate it. And uh, I hope everybody has a great day wherever you are. Take care. Thank you.